Hello, everybody. Welcome to the April meetup. And I'm very excited about this one. Uh, we all know this is the Open Statistical Programming Meetup. It's not just R, it's R and friends. We have R, we have Python, SQL, Stan, Julia, and JavaScript today. So we're doing a lot. We've had C++. We do any language that's open and statistical based. So we're very happy that this JavaScript language, you know, JavaScript's very big. Um, it's been very big for everyone, very big in the data world lately, not just with um, Python script and web R, but just generally all the things you can do with HTML widgets and JavaScript. So we're very excited to have this talk. But first things first, before we do anything, we start every meetup with, by seeing who is hiring. Since we're not in person, you obviously can't stand up and say anything. In fact, um, Allison and I are the only two people on screen right now. So if you are hiring, go to the NY Hack R Slack and tell us you're hiring. We can get to the NY Hack R Slack. I'll post this in the chat the link to the Slack so everyone here can go join it and post a job. So if you're looking to hire somebody, go to the link I just sent you, join our Slack, go to the job, the job postings or jobs posting, search for jobs, and you'll see the channel there, and you can put your job up there. Uh, always looking to get people hired here. So after you've gone and posted a job, let us know where you got your pizza from. Mine is from Tapo. Those of you in the city know that there's Tapo, Vezo, Posto, Grupo, and a few others. Uh, we got ours from Tapo. And you see, you know, you see the nice charring on the back. You know, it looks like it was in a gas deck oven. There's some perforation there when they rolled out the dough. Good cheese lock. It's been sitting at home for, you know, about 10 minutes, but the, the cheese lock is there. So I'm very excited. So folks, let us know where you got your pizza or other food from. If it's other food, let us know what it is. If it's pizza, tell us where it's from. We're always very excited to share this with you. So that's our pizza for this week, for this month. Um, next month, we are very excited. We'll be back both in person and virtual. The exact announcement will go out tomorrow, but the May meetup will be on May 9th, in person and virtual, and it will feature Jeff Ryan. Those of you who don't know, he is the person behind the original creator of XTS for time series objects and QuantMod for pulling financial data and the ever so active base R user. We are very excited to have him. The announcement will go out tomorrow of all the details. If, you will, if you're in the city or near the city and want to attend in person, great. If you're virtual, attend virtually. We're going to do it both. We're very excited for this meetup. Again, that's May 9th, Jeff Ryan, going to be very exciting days. Also, other upcoming, both in person, and, oh, actually, before we even get to those, we have speakers lined up for June and July but we don't have space. So if you have office space or event space or theater space or any kind of space in New York and you'd like to host the meetup, be in touch. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me at jarelander.com. You can find me on Meetup. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me at landeranalytics.com. You can find me in so many places. Find me and let me know you have space. Uh, we're really interested in doing more and more of these, both in-person and virtual, but we need space. Before the pandemic, we had tons of companies always had office space available of various sizes. We'd love to get back into that. So let me know if you have space because we are looking both for June and July and just the rest of the year in general. Anytime we have space available, we will host it in person and virtual. So let me know. Other upcoming events that we do have space for already is the New York R Conference. We did like the first big blast the other day. Uh, it is July 11th through 14th, both in person here in New York City same theater as last time, the French Institute, and virtual on the virtual platform. Uh, 11 through 14, the first two days of workshops by like Rob Hyman and Max Kuhn and a whole bunch of other workshops. Then the next two days are two days of conferences. Those of you that have attended, you know what they're like. 20 minute talks, no questions. Every three speakers, at most, there's a break. Sometimes after two speakers, lots of food. There's breakfast, there's lunch, there's snacks, there's drinks, there's music, and just really good educational opportunity. If you want to learn more, I'm going to paste the URL in the chat. And if you use code NYHackR, part of my loud keyboard, if you use code NYHackR, you'll get 20% off tickets. Uh, we're very excited. I think this is like, this is the now the ninth annual. I have to do the math, might be eighth annual, I'll check. Um, we've been doing this for a while. We are very excited to be back in person again for our second year in a row and virtual. So we have both really excited. Another, one of our conferences, in fact, I'm wearing the NYR shirt. That's how excited I am. 
Now, I own a lot of these shirts, so I wear these almost every day in different shades. I have all the different colors, but you know, I'm really excited nonetheless. And it's for the Rangers tonight. Let's go Rangers, right? So October 18th through 20th is our R in Government and Public Sector Conference in Washington, DC at Georgetown. So October 18th through 20th, the first day is, is workshops. The next two days are conferences, similar format as NYR, 20 minute talks, but there is obviously a government and public sector theme. And that's government at the local, state, county, federal, international levels. We have people from other governments around the world. It's public sector like education and nonprofits. Again, for that, you can go to this URL, which is very similar to the NYR URL, you'll notice. It's rstats.ai slash gov, very similar. Also, the discount code NYHackCar, sorry, NYHackCar gets you 20% off tickets. We are very excited about that. It's going to officially go live tomorrow, I believe. If you're looking to speak at the meetup or one of the conferences, send me a message. Easy way to get in touch, right? Send me a message. We're always looking for speakers for both the conference and the meetup. And we have one more conference we're helping put on down in Tampa in August. I forgot the dates. I didn't write it down. That's what happens when you don't write it down. But you can go to d4con.io to learn more about that. And again, if you go to that website and you want to buy tickets, use code NYHackR for 20% off. So lots of discount opportunities. Um, if you're looking to speak or sponsor, be in touch. Lastly, if you want to learn more about our previous talks for the meetup, go to nyhackr.org, just like the discount code. Notice the theme here? Go to that and we will, um, there's videos up there, there's slideshows, there's listing of events, lots of good stuff. Then really one more lastly, for questions, since we can't all just stand up and raise our hand because we're in this virtual box here, if you have a question, put it in Slack. Please don't put it in Zoom. I can't copy and paste from the Zoom chat. I've never been able to. I've been trying for years now. I can't copy and paste. And I need to keep these notes written down somewhere. So please go to Slack. I'll put up the email address for Slack one more time. Go there and there is a channel called Monthly Meetup Chat. Go there, ask the question there. I will collate the questions. And at the end of the talk, I will ask them. Life will be a lot easier for everybody if you do it in the Slack, not in Zoom. Please, thank you. All right, with that. I am very excited for this JavaScript talk. Um, plotting in JavaScript is so hot right now. And we have an excellent speaker. And you may know her from her car uh, cartoons are the wrong words, drawings. Cartoonish. Cartoons great. I don't think cartoons Cart is a bad word. Yeah, drawings, cartoons. Yeah, whatever you want to call them. If you've seen any tidyverse style drawing lately, it was most likely made by her. And not just lately, we're talking for years now. They're really awesome. Every time I see them, I love seeing these things. Um, she does a lot of other cool stuff beyond these drawings, but they're freaking awesome. So go check them out, look up her, her drawings, and she's going to give us a talk today about plotting in JavaScript uh, using a grammar, is it a grammar of graphics is what we're going to say? It? Using grammar of graphics, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. So everyone, please welcome an emoji. Welcome to Allison. Awesome. Thank you so much. So while I'm sharing my screen, I'll just say, Thanks a bunch for the invitation to join you. I did not get the pizza memo. Uh, so now I'm jealous of, it sounds like multiple folks who are, are eating pizza during this session, but I'll try to grab some after. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm Allison. Hello, longtime R user, teacher, artist, um, fan. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce uh, a new tool that I think is a really nice entryway to get into JavaScript data visualization. And that's a library called Observable Plot. Um, so I'm going to do, I'm going to walk through some slides, but I'm going to try to get through the slides quickly because what I really want to get to is some uh, interactive coding that we can all do together. Um, and you'll be, you can if you want. You can either watch as I code, or you'll see that you'll be able to write uh, JavaScript code right along with me in a little notebook that we'll be playing with. So I'll start with some slides, and, and I'm planning on these only being maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, but first, if you're not familiar, if you've been working in R um, or other languages and aren't familiar with JavaScript, JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. Um, that oftentimes is described as the language that like brings the web to life. Uh, so if 
HTML is kind of the bones and CSS adds some styling. JavaScript is the way that we can make things interactive or animated. Um, but you can also like just work, it's a, it is a complete programming language. You can do your analysis and modeling and um, data wrangling all in JavaScript too, but this is kind of how it's most commonly known. Um, and if you've been working in R or Python uh, to do data visualization, especially interactive data visualization, you might have already actually been using JavaScript under the hood. So if you've used packages like Plotly or HiCharter or Giraffe, and I love Giraffe, just a little shout out to Giraffe. They're all wonderful, but um, Giraffe, I, I really, really adore. Um, our HTML widgets, a lot of these under the hood um, are wrapping JavaScript code to make interactive plots. And so that's awesome. And if that is all that you need, uh, then I think that's great. But at some point, like I think this this tweet from Tanya Shapiro, who's an amazing um, data visualization expert, says it you might find yourself like the more you're trying to create interactive visualizations for the web, the more you might just want to like create it in JavaScript, like in the in the language of the web, um, as you want to create things that are more customized or or actually see the actual code that's creating it. So at some point, you might find that it comes back to JavaScript. Uh, but that's all right, because JavaScript, it turns out, is a really fun language to learn. Um, and another, another reason you might uh, have been thinking or hearing about JavaScript, and in particular, Observable, which is the company that I work for, is that Quarto um, enables you to also add uh, JavaScript in in cells, in code chunks, in uh, Quarto documents. So you're actually able to include JavaScript code, like all of the code that I'll write today that we're working in an observable notebook. Um, you might see this showing up as OJS cells within your Quarto documents. So you could add it there too. And then once you render it, then you would be able to see the outputs of those cells too. So in particular, we're gonna be um, learning a bit about one particular library. Uh, we're also gonna learn a few JavaScript basics that I think are like in my like top five, wish I had known when I started. So we'll learn some basic programming uh, just through our examples. But we're gonna be focusing on this library called Observable Plot, which is a JavaScript library for fast and fully customizable web-ready data visualizations. And it's from the team that created D3. Um, and as a comparison uh, in data visualization, D3 is this really popular and widely used framework for creating highly customized data visualizations. But it also means that even to create kind of standard chart types, you're often building every single piece from scratch. Uh, so you can, it, it has the, the flexibility of truly like manufacturing and customizing every single detail of a chart. But that also comes with it um, maybe 50 lines of code to make a relatively standard bar chart because you're really building it piece by piece. Um, plot is built on D3 by the team that made D3, which means it also plays nicely with D3. It can be extended with D3, but there is an added layer of ab abstraction in plot that uh, means that you get to start with code that's a little bit closer to some of these like standard charts that you might want to create, um, which means that you can get up and running uh, a, a quite a bit faster than maybe you would with D3, but it's also a great entryway to, to learning D3. And at the same time, it's in JavaScript, which means that it's uh, still expressive and fully customizable, um, but can provide this nice entryway uh, that then you can continue building on and add D3 for animations and transitions, et cetera. So we're going to be starting with observable plot today. Um, and hopefully for those of you where you've already been working in ggplot, I hope that this quote from Mike Bostock, creator of D3 and observable plot shares, which is that plot employs a layered grammar of graphics inspired by Vega Light. GGplot2, Wilkinson's Grammar of Graphics, and Burton's Symbology of Graphics, 
Um, so the plot, we don't refer to a specific chart type. Um, instead, we build charts layer by layer using marks, scales, and transforms. Uh, so this hopefully is like when you see these comparisons I'm going to show next between between GG plot code and observable plot code, you see like how closely they align. Um, which just like just to say, if you are already working in GG plot, um, that means you've been building your like understanding and practice of using the grammar of graphics to build charts, and that maps like directly onto how we're going to create charts in observable plot. So you're actually already like a lot of the way there. So you know a lot if you you know a lot about observable plot if you've been building charts in ggplot. So I wanted to show just before we hop into a couple of examples, which is going to be the bulk of the time that I spend today, um, is a minimal viable min minimal minimum minimum viable comparison between ggplot code shown on the left here and observable plot code shown on the right here. Now, it can be a little bit when you first start JavaScript, I remember feeling like what I'm a little bit overwhelmed because there's a lot more braces, brackets, and parentheses that I'm used to, and that's true. Um, but what I'll try to highlight today is like the big conceptual pieces and how those align between the two, because um, then we'll actually use some starter code to help us create graphs in a way that hopefully means we don't have to get stuck on parentheses and curly braces, for example. So looking at these two minimum viable uh, code, functional pieces of code side by side, the left in R and ggplot, the right in JavaScript and observable plot, what are the major pieces and how do these align? Um, this first line in orange in each, if it's ggplot or plot.plot, .plot, those are doing the same thing. It's initializing a plot, saying like, we are creating a plot now. So that's the first piece, right? That's one of like, three major things we need to tell each of these tools. What's the next thing? The next thing is the marks that we are using. Um, so in both of these cases, we're not specifying a chart type. We're not saying scatter plot. We are saying this is the mark that we're gonna add to this chart area to represent our data visually. Um, Cause a, a dot, right? Whether it's G on point or plot dot dot, those can add a point and it can be a scatter plot, but it could also be a bubble chart on a map, right? So we're not specifying the chart type, we're specifying the marks that we're going to add to this plot area based on the values of our data. So that's the second thing, is these specify marks. You'll notice here that that marks uh, in, in observable plot is kind of explicitly given its own um, key here. So it says this is the marks section, because we can also do some customization outside of marks that get applied to the whole chart area. So that's the second thing is we specify our marks, whether it's a geom point, so geoms in ggplot, or these plot dot or plot line or plot area uh, marks in observable plot. Within that mark, we need to tell each of these tools two things. We need to say, okay, what data are you pulling information from? And what are the variables that you're plotting? So how are those, how is data getting mapped um, into this chart space for the X and Y axis? Uh, and that really is like these produce the the same thing. These both will create a scatter plot of weight versus miles per gallon from this car's data set. And we can see that these like major building blocks are the same for each of them. Now, there are some differences. Um, so I just wanted to show a few comparisons. I consider these things way more similar than they are different, both in like how they're designed and also in a lot of the vocabulary and terminology. So this is just comparing some kind of common uh, options and marks that you might see. So if I look at the right two columns, if I want to change the fill color of a shape, I use fill in both. But if I want to change the outline color or the line color um, in ggplot, I use color in observable plot, that's stroke. Uh, if I want to change the size based on a constant or a variable in ggplot, we usually change the size. And in observable plot, we use R for the radius. In ggplot, to change opacity, we use alpha. In observable plot, it's just opacity. Um, and then looking further down at a couple of the marks, we can see that like 
yeah, they're different in the way that that we type them out. Like we don't have geom underscore under underscore and then the actual mark type. Um, but we just have like plot and then or geom and then what the specific mark type is that we want to visually represent our data using. Uh, so I think like, yes, there are differences. And I oftentimes will have to, you know, go back and look, look something up like, oh, this, what is this thing in R in ggplot mapped onto this thing in observable plot. Um, but overall, like the options that are available and how much you can customize your chart are really, really similar across the two. Um, and if you want to check out an interactive side-by-side -side comparison, and I'll go ahead and drop this in the chat, hopefully copy link address, uh, then you can, maybe Jerry will share it. Oh, I'm not sure um, if that's sending the right thing. That didn't copy the, the correct thing. But I'll send that along uh, maybe afterwards. And that just provides a side-by-side -side comparison and an interactive view of, um, of basically like functioning ggplot code, customized ggplot code versus the analogous code to create it with observable plot. All right, so I think that was under 10 minutes or close to it, which I wanted to keep it to for slides because I really want this to mostly be like a, a showing instead of telling session. Um, so I want to then uh, share with you all a notebook that I'm going to be working in that you can work into. So I'm going to copy um, this URL and I think I should be able to share it, though I always have kind of a hard time. Um, let me see if I can. So I'm not sure if that gets sent out to everybody, but uh, maybe Jared, if that doesn't go to everyone on the call, if you um, can can share that with a group on Slack, maybe that's there, that would be awesome. Yep, I'll make sure and I'll put it on Slack too, like I'll get it everywhere. Perfect, thanks so much. Okay, so, I want to first talk about what you're looking at. So when you click on that link, it should take you to a web page that looks like this. Where is this? So this is an observable notebook. Um, observable notebooks are online canvases where you can combine context with text or images or links or whatever. Uh, so you can combine context with code and the output. So if you've been working in other computational notebooks like our Markdown or Corto or Jupyter notebooks, this might feel similar um, because the way that we create these is in this notebook, we add content that's always within different cells. So if you're curious like how this text is added, if you ever click on the arrow to the left of any of these cells, um, that, that alligator mouth uh, to the left, then it will reveal if it's not already pinned to show up automatically, it will reveal in this case that this is created in Markdown. So we have Markdown cells, but there's also a bunch of other cell types that you can add in an observable notebook. Um, and if you wanna see the many different types, if you wanna insert a new cell, you can click on this plus button anywhere in the margin where you see a plus button. And that brings up the add cell menu. So you can see right up top kind of the three major cell types, JavaScript, Markdown, and HTML. Um, but we also have a lot of specialty cell types that let you create, create like really quick interactive tables, for example. Or like we'll see later that actually uh, give us some skeleton code to create different plot types. Um, and for just to, to show how this can work, if I do plus and then look for a scatter plot. It's a searchable menu. So as soon as I start typing, it'll narrow those results. If I press enter, then I it'll automatically insert this JavaScript cell. And then if I run that either by pressing this blue arrow or with shift return, then I'll see a scatter plot show up and I can replace the data and variables. But that's just to show that if you wanted to add more cells within this notebook, um, then you can press that, that little plus symbol and that's our add cell menu to create new cells. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one, um, which I can just get to by clicking on that vertical three dot menu anywhere here. All right, so what you might've noticed, hopefully, hopefully I'm monologuing on this, hopefully everybody has gotten a chance to make it to this notebook. 
what's kind of cool about working these notebooks is whether or not you have an observable account, you can follow along with the examples that I'm doing today. Um, and that's because notebooks have what's called a tinker mode. So you might have noticed that even though you're not an editing author on this notebook, if you make changes to it, you would just see a banner up top saying like, hey, heads up, you're working in tinker mode, your changes won't be saved. Um, if you have an observable account, then you can fork this notebook and that'll store a copy with your changes. But for now, if you don't have an account, that's all right. I'll share the key so you can still have everything that we've done today. Uh, but you can still follow along and do everything that I do. It'll just be in tinker mode. Um, so you could still try stuff out. Okay, so that is a little intro to observable notebooks. Now let's go ahead and get into observable plot. Okay, so if I scroll down to activity one, and again, you can follow me along if you have a second screen or set these up side by side. Um, the first activity, we're gonna make a horizontal bar chart. And this is gonna be using uh, data from the EIA, the US Energy Information Administration. And I've already created a subset here that's stored as energy underscore 2021. And in this, it's actually stored as an array. In this array, there are three properties. <clears throat> There's the type of energy, which is like the primary source. There's the year for this energy production value. And then there's the actual amount created. So in quadrillion BTU for that source for that year, what was the total production across the country? So what we're going to do is this has already been filtered to 2021. We're going to go ahead and we are going to make an interactive chart uh, with observable plot. But first, we're going to make a static chart. So the way that I'm going to do that is, and, and if you ever get stuck on any of this stuff, in this notebook, we have the show me buttons. And if you just click the arrow next to the show me, it will reveal the code that actually creates the chart I'm gonna make next. So you can copy that code, paste it into a new JavaScript cell, which again, you can get to using this plus symbol and choosing JavaScript and then run the code with shift return or by pressing that blue arrow. So you should always be able to create the charts that I'm making. Okay. But I'm going to start from pseudo scratch, not really, but I'm going to start by clicking on this add cell menu, and then I'm going to start by typing horizontal, and because I know that I want to create a horizontal bar chart. So could I type this from a blank JavaScript cell? Absolutely, for time, so we can see a few more examples. I'm going to start with a snippet. Once I click on that, then it will populate with this skeleton code, a functional code that's working. I promise it still counts as coding if you start from a plot snippet. Um, it's still, still a valid way to create a chart. Uh, but what are we actually seeing here? So this uses, this, this first line is saying, initialize the plot, cool. That's like my GG plot line, initialize the plot. And then within this marks, um, option here. And then this marks option, I'm telling it what the different marks are that I want to create. So there's actually two in this. There's a horizontal bar, which is this plot.bar x. And then there's this plot rule x. All this one is doing, as we'll see, is this cr is creating a vertical line at a value of zero. Um, so that's totally optional, but we'll see it when we run it. This uses a built in data set that already exists within an observable called alphabet which has in it variables for letters of the alphabet and the frequency that those letters show up in a sample data set of text. It also has uh, some optional, um, some options here for actually sorting this to get those bars in order from high to low. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see that it creates this horizontal bar chart. Um, what's nice about these plot code skeletons is that I can then just replace these placeholders in the skeleton code with our data's data set name and variables. So here, if I then change this to, and let me make sure what I called this. Okay, so this is called energy underscore 2021. So I'm going to change this data set. That's the first thing that plot bar X needs to energy 2021. You can use tab completion if you want here. The x-axis is going to be the amount produced each year, which is in quadrillion underscore BTU. That's that variable name or that property key. 
And then Y, I'm gonna have the type. So that's the type of energy. And then if I run this, and again, I can do shift return or plus press that blue arrow button in that cell, then I can see that I have an ordered horizontal bar chart for these different types of energy. One thing that you'll notice is that uh, there's a default margin, but we can customize anything that we would want to here. So oftentimes if you're working in ggplot, those will end up in like a, an overarching like theme section of your plot. We're just gonna put those right within this uh, plot dot plot section of our code, but outside of the mark section, because this is being applied to the entire chart area. So outside of the marks, if I add a comma, I'll press enter just for vertical organization, I can change my margin left. Notice the camel case here, which you'll see all the time in JavaScript, including throughout observable plot. And I can increase that maybe to like, 200 pixels, and then that'll change that left margin. Um, I kind of think about a lot of questions about options the way that I do for ggplot. Like if I'm like, can you change this? Can I change this? Can I change this? The answer is yes. Um, and I just have to find a way to do it. So this is, is fully customizable. Uh, so just to make one more change, I'm going to go ahead and add a fill color as a constant, but up in this mark. So this is going to be a fill that's applied to this plot bar X. So it could be anywhere within here, but I'm going to add it right after Y. I'm going to say I want to make the fill color red. And I could add a, a stroke option so I could have a stroke. I could change the opacity here using the opacity option, again, ranging from zero to one like it does in ggplot. But for now, we have this static chart that has the constant fill color. Um, but what I want to do is let's quickly make this interactive. For this first one, we're going to be doing something that is like maybe not functionally super valuable, but does highlight kind of the lightweightness of adding interactivity to a chart created with observable plot um, when you're working in JavaScript. And the way that we're going to do that is to create a, a, an interface element or a widget using what are called observable inputs. And observable inputs are the observable version of pre-made widgets. Um, so if I come up here right above my chart, I'm going to create this widget right above this chart. So I'm going to click that Add Cell menu. And I'm going to search for color because I know that there is an existing input that lets you choose a color from a palette and will return the value of a hexadecimal color code. When I select that, then this will automatically create this again code uh, for a default widget. And if I run that, then that widget shows up in my notebook. Uh, this blue pin here means that the actual code is pinned. If I wanna hide it, I can always just click on that blue pin and then that won't be shown by default but then I can reveal it again if I wanna work there and I can repin it if I want that to always show up by default. So here, what's happening? A couple of important things are happening is first, this creates a new widget. This inputs.color, this creates this specific color widget, but there's also like inputs radio, radio buttons and for checkboxes and drop down menus and text inputs and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but here, this is a specific one that lets you choose a color. So you can notice that there's like, you can change the label for it. Maybe I'll say like, pick a color. And that just changes the label that shows up to the left of it. I can change the default value. That's what this value option does here. So here, maybe I'll make this coffee. Um, so that's my terrible default color. But a key here is that when you create an input, that's not only creating the widget, but it's also storing the value of the current selection. So this isn't necessary, but just to like show you what's happening is I'm essentially creating a dynamic variable where here, if I call color then anywhere else, what's actually stored in color, because that's the name of the widget here, is the value of the current selection. So as I like, move this around, then you can see that the value stored as color is also changing along with it. 
And this is cool because this gives us a tool, this gives us a variable that is connected, that is connected to the input selection that I can just call wherever I want to then change my chart or text or table filtering or whatever. So to make my chart interactive here, instead of saying, I want the fill color to be this static red, I'm just gonna say, I want the fill to actually be based on this hexadecimal color code that is the current color value. And when I do that, then I can see that not only does it update here, but now as I move around in this widget that I can see that the value of color is updated as I move it. And that is actually what's being used as the fill color. Um, so is this functionally critical? No, but the takeaway I hope is that like the process of adding interactivity using observable to a chart is create the widget and give it a name using observable inputs. That gets automatically stored as a value that is the name of that widget, in this case, color. And then you can use that wherever else you want in charts or wherever else as this interactive or dynamic variable that's changing based on the user selection. And since we're already on the web, working in the language of the web, this is an automatically shareable interactive chart. Like if I just sent this to somebody just with the link, then they would be able to play with this. So, so there's no like rendering and then hosting this somewhere. Um, it's already good to go as an interactive chart. Um, and there's a lot of options if you're working in observable uh, to embed your different pieces in different ways. So you can either download charts, but you can also embed them in other websites like your blogs or, or other sites that you might want to add them to. So it becomes easy, pretty lightweight to add interactivity and also to then share interactive pieces. Okay, so that's uh, a first example. Um, the second example where we'll do something that that hopefully is a, is a little bit more functionally relevant when we add interactivity. Um, but also we're gonna learn just a few like core JavaScript essentials. So I'm gonna scroll down to this second activity. Um, so this is from the data set, except now I haven't filtered to only include data from 2021. So you can see here in this data table cell, uh, we have still our different types or different primary sources for the different energy, um, but we also have this across different years and we still have quadrillion BTUs as the units for how much we've produced for each energy type for each year. So what we're gonna do now that we have this longitudinal data is create a line chart for each of these different sources to see patterns and how they've been changing over time. And then we're gonna add interactivity that lets us highlight one of those at a time. Um, there's not so many groups that this is like an overwhelming spaghetti plot, uh, but it can still be nice to highlight. And especially if we had a lot more types, then it can be really nice um, to just highlight one series at a time, for example. So that's what we're gonna do in this next example. So we're gonna start first a static line chart of each of these energy sources over time, and then we'll add interactivity. And that's where we will learn some JavaScript essentials. So I'll start, and again, that show me button is here um, if you get stuck at any point, but I'm gonna start by clicking this insert cell button and it's searchable. So once I'm in that add cell menu, I can start typing line. And I can see that the first option is to create a line chart of values over time, which is what we wanna do. But you can see there's a bunch of different options. So I'll choose this first one to create a line chart. Again, this is already functional code. This uses Apple um, closing value, I think, for Apple stocks. Uh, if I run this, this uses uh, an existing data set. So I could do that. Um, but we wanna use our US energy data. So to do that, I'll make sure, so this is called energy production. That's how I've stored this data set. So I'm gonna replace in my line Y, I'm gonna replace that Apple data set with energy production or data. And then I need to replace my X and Y variables so that it's not what this pre-populated code was in the snippet um, to say on the X axis, I'm gonna use that variable that's stored as year. And on the y-axis, I'm going to use our quadrillion BTU again. And when I run this, 
you might see something that is familiar if you've been working in ggplot, which is like, why are you not recognizing these different series? Sometimes this will show up in ggplot. You'll see these like vertical line steps. It's like, what's happening? And then, and then realize like, oh, right. It like this code has no idea that there is another variable in this data that's helpful to differentiate between the different series. And that's what we need to provide this plot code. So just to talk through this again, I am initializing a plot. This is the equivalent of ggplot in a ggplot code. And then I have plot um, rule. All this plot rule zero, rule y zero is doing is creating this horizontal line at y equals zero. But if I get rid of that, so I'll just comment that out, uh, which in JavaScript is just a double backslash. Um, then like there's there's no more horizontal line. It's hard to tell since there's some of these some of these series are right along the um, that axis anyway, but that just removes that x axis. All right, so I have uh, within this mark saying like how am I visually representing this data? I'm creating a line chart. Um, you've, using data from energy production where I have this new object saying what my x-axis variable is, and which is year, and what my y-axis variable is, which is in quadrillion BTU. But I also need to tell it like, okay, this is the variable that actually can be used to differentiate different series here. And I can do that by setting a stroke, just like if you set a color aesthetic in ggplot, it'll automatically recognize like, oh, if that's based on a variable, then these are gonna be treated as different series. But I can also set that here using Z. So I can say Z, I want to say differentiate these different series based on the type um, column. So that type property. All right. So currently, um, and we could we could label these, we could add a legend, we can we can customize this however we want. Um, what I want to do next is let's go ahead and make this interactive by creating radio buttons of these different energy types and whichever one a user chooses from those radio buttons, that's going to get highlighted in red while the rest of these series are in gray. So that's going to be our next step is to add interactivity. Um, just as a reminder, again, the show me code is here. That'll get you to essentially like very close to, to what we've created above. So you can get back on, on track there. Okay, so let's make this interactive. Again, I am gonna go right above this chart because that's where I want my widget to show up. Um, one thing that, uh, well, there's a couple things here that I just wanna acknowledge might feel a little bit um, unfamiliar if you've been working in our Markdown or in Quarto Docs or in Jupyter Notebooks is that when you're, when you're working in observable notebooks, the output shows up immediately above the, the cell where you've written the code. And another major way that observable notebooks work differently is that the code runs topologically, um, which means that you can put cells in any order that you want to, and it will just look to wherever other cells that it depends on are in the notebook. So you don't, unlike R, where like, if you want to use something that um, if C requires B and A, then B and A have to be earlier on in the code. That's not the case for observable notebooks. You can have things exist in whatever order you want throughout the notebook. So I know that those are a little bit unfamiliar. Okay, so let's go ahead and create this new widget. I'm going to click on this add cell menu again, and I'm going to start typing radio because that's gonna produce this input. So again, this is called an observable input, which is these like pre-created widgets um, made in JavaScript. And that's going to, when I select it, if I just run what's created out of the box, it creates a widget with A and B. So important thing here, this is called radios. So if I thought you don't have to do this, but if I then later on say, hey, give me the value of radios, then that just stores the current selection in this radio. So you can see it switching between A and B. But we can see here that the way that I create these different buttons that a user can choose from is by creating an array of the different possible choices. So this is bounded by square brackets. Um, so this is a JavaScript array. If I add C here, then there's three options. But we don't want to, we could here manually type like, solar and we could manually type like 
all the different types we could put into our array. But instead, we're going to use a little bit of JavaScript code. So I'm going to explain this as I go. So I want to, from this energy production data set, I want to access all of the different unique types of energy. And I want those to be what show up in this radio buttons widget. So to do that, I'm going to, as this first element, I'm going to say, hey, starting from energy production, then I'm going to use an array map method, um, which has a specific job. So I'm going to use that by using dot map. And then I have open and close parentheses. And map has a specific job that is to iterate over each element in an array and return something based on the outcome of a function that's within this map method. Um, so this is just iterating over every object in that energy production data set, which in our case, we can think of as every row. The next thing I'm gonna do, and this is another JavaScript essential, is I'm gonna use what's called an arrow function to access just the type columns value. So that'll just get me an array of all of the different types that show up in that type column. And to do that, this is called an arrow function. This is just a concise way of writing a function where I say like, hey, for a parameter D, which in our case is each of those different rows, I want to access, you'll sometimes hear this called an accessor function, I want to access the value in the type column. So again, if I just ran this, and I'm not going to, if you pressed ran already, that's okay. But if I just run this, this is going to return every single value in the type column, whether or not it repeats, because um, it's iterated over each row and accessed the type value. But luckily, there's also an option within inputs uh, to say, I want to only show each thing, each thing once, which is to add within this object um, where I can add these options, is to say unique true. And so if I run that, then what I get is this widget that now has each of my different possible sources. And notice that here it says, choose the default value of A, but that doesn't match any of the things that are up here. So I'm gonna change this to one that does exist. So I'll change the default value to coal. And that means that my um, coal will be selected by default. But I can see then as I switch these, I can see that the values that radio is storing is also changing. So as I select around, that's just storing a different um, value as radios. And you can change the name too. Like if I wanted to change this, I could change this to pick source, for example. Let's go ahead and change this in our chart. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna change the stroke color of these lines so that it depends on that user selection. And again, this pattern is like, I've created a chart, then I've created a widget, I've created an element using inputs that's gonna store a value based on user selection. And then because that value is stored by that input name, I can call that back to use it as a way to make my, my plots or my text or whatever interactive. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and do that with the, the stroke, the line color. And this is gonna be the third JavaScript programming essential that we're gonna cover. I think this is the last one. So we'll just do these three. But to change the line color, I want this to be conditional. So I wanna say, if the, if the series name, so if the type here matches that user selection, so if that matches this value of radios, then I want the line to be red. So if, if, if the value of the type matches the radios selection, I want it to be red. If not, I want it to be gray. And we're gonna use what's called a ternary operator here. And to do that, this is essentially the same as an if else statement in R or other programming languages. I'm gonna write a little function that says, okay, I wanna access the type value from each of my rows. And if that value matches radios, so if that matches the current selection of radios, then, and then you have a question. So you say like, hey, does the type value match radios? If true, do this first thing immediately after the question mark, then I want the stroke to be red. If not, then we have a single colon, then I want the line to be 
a light gray or you could type gray or you could type yellow here. So any um, valid web color codes or hex hexadecimal codes will work here. Make sure you have this comma at the end of this line. And now when I run this, um, because I have this if else statement written using the ternary operator that asks, hey, if the type value matches radios, then make it red. Otherwise, make the stroke light gray. Then when I run this, then I can see that when I change these, and I'll unpin this so we can see it all in one place, then as I change these, we can see that only the value, um, only, only the series where it matches the user selection for radios is actually showing up as red and everything else is showing up as light gray. Um, so it's kind of cool, right? Like this is like really two steps to an interactive and shareable chart that you can make. You make the chart, make the widget with a name, that input stores a value that's dynamic based on the user selection. And then you can use that dynamic uh, variable for that input anywhere else you want to, to create an interactive chart. All right. Um, so we're gonna do one more, which is let's, let's make a map uh, and we'll, we can make an interactive map, which will be cool. Let's go ahead, cause I don't wanna, to uh, spend too long. I know that these, these virtual sessions can feel like they're dragging. So I want to um, be done presenting on this by the hour. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and copy this code and I'll talk through it a little bit. But if you go ahead to the show me code, copy it, create a new JavaScript cell, and then paste it in there, then this code creates a map. So again, all I've done here is I've copied that activity three show me code from the show me option. I've copied that code, pasted it into a JavaScript cell. And then when I run it, then I see this map show up of the US. Um, to talk through this, this is also just like following like a grammar of graphics to build piece by piece what we want to be represented in this map. I initialize the plot. The one additional piece with spatial data is letting it that I am including here is letting it know how um, this information from a sphere should be mapped on to 2D space. This is using Albers USA, but like I could change this to Mercator. It's not going to be great, but now we have a Mercator projection. Um, but I'll change this back to Albers USA. Um, but you can use the different built-in uh, projections, and we have documentation to, to show you how. Um, but then what's happening within the marks? Well, here I have two marks. The first one is just creating this background United States map, which pulls from uh, states data that I had imported later on in the notebook. We can use it here because the order doesn't matter, but I had imported it previously. Um, and then this just provides some aesthetic customization. Uh, so I have this light gray line around each state, but the polygon fills are white and I've made the stroke width a little bit narrower. So that would just, if I just did that, that would create, um, that would create just the US base map here. And then on top of that, and again, following the grammar of graphics, on top of that, I'm adding this other mark. I'm adding on top of it, this plot dot dot, which is used to actually create the bubbles. And for a little bit of context, what this is plotting is each of these locations are a different power plant in the United States from this US underscore plants data set that I had already preloaded here. So we have a longitude and latitude for each. We also have the total capacity and the primary source for that plant. So here I have um, what we're showing here is we have each point, the location, the, the centroid of each point is based on the long, latitude, longitude and latitude for each of those. Uh, but I also have a fill color based on the primary source. So each of these fill colors represents a different plant type. Um, I have... each of these the same level but but this uh slightly translucent circle um down here what i'm doing is is updating some of these scales so this line notice that it's outside of the mark uh, but this is setting a new range of sizes for the different circles 
you'll notice if I comment that out, then those circles just have a different size range. So you can constrain um, the scale across which these different channels are actually mapped. Um, and I've updated the color scheme. But here, what I want to do is just show that like how what we've already learned also works for a map. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this line to update the color channel. You don't have to actually, it'll work just fine. This takes me back to a default color scheme. And let's go ahead and make this interactive. Um, so again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create radio buttons again. This could also be checkboxes or a drop down menu with multiple selections or something. I'm going to change the name of this to say like pick source. Now that's going to be the value that gets stored. And I'm going to do my little JavaScript data wrangling again using a map and an arrow function, two JavaScript essentials um, that we're already using here. So this is from US plants. I'm going to iterate over each row or each object in that array, which looks like a rectangular table in that data table cell above. And I'm going to say from each of those, I want to access the primary underscore source value, primary underscore source. So that would return every single value of primary source. But to make sure I only return each once, I'm going to add unique true as one of my options here. And now I can see that I just have each one of my sources represented one single time. And then maybe I'll change the default selection to solar. So this is just creating um, based on an existing call. You could write these out manually, but this is just programmatically creating these radio buttons based on the unique levels uh, within that primary source column of our data. Okay, so this remember is stored as pick source here. Now this gives us a, a, a variable that stores whatever this user has selected, which means that then down in my map, I can again say, okay, well, instead of the fill color being based on a different color for each primary source, if I just wanna highlight one at a time, then I'm gonna again use my ternary operator. So I'm gonna say, hey, look in the primary source column. So that's what this little accessor function is doing is as you iterate through each row in this data, look in the primary source column and ask, does that match the value that's currently selected from that pick source input? Because we had named that input pick source. And if that returns true, so I have a question mark, I say, is that true? Then do this thing immediately after the question mark. So I'll say, make that red. But if that's false, then I can return, let's say, like yellow to make this totally horrendous. So again, this is just using a ternary operator to say, if the primary source matches the user selection, then I want it to stand out in red. Otherwise, I want that to be in yellow. This is going to look really bad. Let's run it anyway. OK, <laughs> so we can see, yes, sure enough, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't stand it. I'm changing it to. To my light gray. Okay, but you but you see what happens is that now we have again, we have um, a way that we can pretty quickly create this interactive map that shows where these different sources are. You might be wondering at this time, like, oh, I noticed that the one I've selected shows up behind some of these. You can change it so that um, in the in the first position, so the one plotted on top, you can change the domain order uh, so that it won't be behind these. But another option too is to play with opacity, just like we would play with the fill color. So as a last um, interactivity example, I'm gonna say, hey, I also want opacity to be interactive. So I'm gonna add a new option for opacity, where again, I'm gonna say, does the primary source, primary source match what's selected in that pick source input? And if it does, if, it, if that is true, if it matches that user selection, I want it to be completely opaque. So that means if it matches the user selection here, it will be opaque red. And if not, then I want it to be pretty translucent. So I'll make that 0.2 because one is completely opaque, zero is completely transparent. So this is gonna put anything that doesn't match the user selection towards the more transparent side. 
And then if I run this, then I'll be able to see that when I make selections, then I can see that not only do my, my opacity is not changing here. Hmm. Which I feel like I'm doing something wrong because only the, interesting, only the um, selected sources should be, should be showing up totally um, okay. You have opacity a few lines later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Look at that. Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay. So that was over, which is a, like great to point out, right? Like this will not throw an error, but whatever comes later in the code will override what I had done to, to make this work earlier on. Thank you so much. Now that I've gotten rid of that duplicate opacity that was overriding what I was doing, now I can see that both the opacity and the fill color, that those are both changing based on my user selection um, using that nice ternary operator. So as I select these, now I can really see patterns on where things exist. Like we can see like a concentration of wind power plants along the wind belts. We can see a lot of hydroelectric power plants along the Sierra Nevada and up into the on the West Coast, so we can really start seeing patterns um, for these different power plant primary sources. So to, to, to reiterate, this was just three examples that I hope captured that like the way that we build visualizations with observable plot follows the grammar of graphics really, really closely to the way that you might have been building charts in ggplot. So that's the first thing is that your knowledge of, of the grammar of graphics and ggplot really truly does map um, really nicely to get you up and running quickly in observable plot. And second, that inputs um, in JavaScript, those give us a lightweight way to make interactive data visualizations by creating the, the input um, that stores a value and creates the input at the same time. And then we can call the name of that input later on. And then based on that input's value, which is the user selection, then that'll update our chart or a text or a table or whatever else we've connected that input to. So I am going to stop there um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, I think. And uh, maybe we can hop into some questions. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And I'll give you a clap here, a golf clap. And hopefully everyone else can do an emoji clap. Um, I had a fantastic time watching that. And I'm sure that everyone else did as well. Thank you. Very welcome. So let's ask a few questions here. I have a bunch of different ones collated from different sources. Um, well, first question about observable. Is this free? Is it unlimited use? How do, I, how do people you know, get charged for this? Great question. So. Yeah, you can have a um, free account. The there are uh, limits on like how much data you can upload, like file size per notebook, and I think also a, a monthly quota. Um, so there are a couple of different reasons why you might want to upgrade to the paid account. Although you can like try it out, play in JavaScript, create all your plots. Like you can do that for free. Um, but the if if you wanted to work in private notebooks, then that's when you get into the paid tiers. Um, and there's also like increases depending on the tier that you're working in, um, changes in the amount of data that you can upload and, and sort of the monthly quotas for for file sizes and, and uploads and stuff. But but yeah, to just get started, free, sign up. If you're happy working publicly, um, then you can absolutely just get started. I'll also just add, like, I spent a lot of years feeling like I needed to learn JavaScript, and then I would get immediately too intimidated by, like, node and console log. <laughs> it's like, I can't, uh, this is too much. I'm not a web developer. Um, so working in Observable is a great way to get started without feeling like that. You can just start, like, like upload a file and start playing with the data in a JavaScript cell. Like, that's all there is to it. Um, so it, it made me feel like I could be successful learning JavaScript as a person who didn't come from a web development background. Right. Yeah, try it out. And let um, us know. Reach out if, if we can help. Like, reach out to me. I can point you in the right directions. Um, but, yeah, if you go to observablehq.com, then that's where you can see our options for signing up. Even the little kids want to learn it. 
I know, right? Every who doesn't? Who doesn't want to do some JavaScript for data work? Exactly, exactly. They got to earn their keep, right? Yep. Uh, so, does the computations happen in my browser or on the observable servers? Yeah. So we don't actually. Um, it's it's on all in your browser. Uh, so like whatever is happening, like in observable, the is where like the code is stored, but like the processing of that, we don't see on our end. Um, so yeah, even if, if you're like, if you connect to a database, for example, through observable, um, like in your notebook on observable, if you're like working in C, there's SQL cells too. So if you're like working in SQL on observable, then your SQL code might be stored there. But like, we actually don't see like the, the process or the outputs or even the data um, is, is on your end. Okay, cool. Um, then can I run this like in V, like something like this in VS code on my computer or does it need to be through the browser? Yeah, only browser-based. All right. And I, don't want to get this wrong, but a way that like I've experienced this that you might notice just in case so nobody gets thrown off is last time I checked and they might have made updates, but like, for example, working in our studio in a Corto doc, right, um, working in a QMD, you can add the JavaScript cell, but like when you, you can't like run it locally, like you can with like an R cell and see the output show up. Um, so to, to see the output, I think I was like rendering. And then once I opened it in the browser, you could actually see the, the outputs from the OJS cells. So just a heads up, if you're, if you're trying to in Corto, um, know that like you're not working in the browser. So it, like you can't see, or at least it was like this. And if somebody's on the that is, has, has tried it more recently or knows more, feel, please feel free to chime in. But I think even there, you're still like rendering it, but then opening it in the browser is when you can actually see the uh, the outputs of the code that you've added. And a JS cell is different than an OJS cell. I've only ever used an OJS cell. So I have, if there is a, if there is a JS cell, then um, yes. Yes. yeah. Okay, so yeah, there are, I'll try to find a link. There are ways um, that observable JavaScript differs a little bit from vanilla JavaScript. They're very similar. Like if you learn JavaScript in an observable notebook, then like you are learning JavaScript. It's like it is JavaScript. One time I asked Mike Bostock, I was like, is it like JavaScript with some sprinkles? And he said, that's about as close as you're going to get. <laughs> so right. you think of it as like JavaScript with sprinkles. Um, but we have this notebook uh, that I'll share that describes um, the difference between them. And they're they're pretty minimal. Um, and a lot of them are related to um, changes that were made so that the reactive runtime that Observable uses actually works, including that like cells can be out of order when you run them. So um, so there's a link, yeah, if, if you want to share that, that kind of describes those minimal differences between vanilla JavaScript and uh, the uh, JavaScript with sprinkles that is Observable JavaScript. Okay. Stick in the whole Quarto JavaScript thread here. Um, if I have a R data frame, or for that matter, a pandas data frame, can I plot that in the OJS cell? Yes, but it needs to go through. And again, last I checked, and things are changing quickly. So don't like things might have changed um, since then. Um, but you use a function um, OJS underscore define. I think I think that's what it is. Uh, to actually convert your um, R object into an object that is understood by observable plot, for example. Uh, so you can work between the two, but it's like one step to make something that you created like a data frame in R available for use in an OJS cell. Yeah, and I think it's OJS underscore define, um, but I know it's in the Quarto docs how, how you can work between the two. And that sounds like an R function, not a JavaScript function. Yeah. Yep. So it's in your R cell where that happens. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's say you say like my DF gets OJS underscore defined MT cars. Then in JavaScript, you would reference it as my DF. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Then that's what you could use in your OJSL. There is one other step that for me I found, um, and actually I can share a, another example too. Um, so I'll, I'll share an example that uh, uh, as I'm sharing it, I'm like, well, why are you sharing this? But that's fine. Um, so this uh, is a post that I did um, that has some like optical character recognition and data wrangling in R and then passes that into some OJS cells. So this entire post is made in a Quarto document for my site. And yeah, if you scroll down, you'll see like, it's all R, 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 R. And then you get to a point um, where down where it says this, those this is a fake data set on bird attacks um, anyway. But then you see where I use OJS define to actually uh, make these usable uh, in OJS cells. And then there's a second step, which isn't technically mandatory, but for my brain, it was a little bit easier, which was to transpose that data. Um, Cause sometimes like they're under the hood, like it is, it is a bit different. Like if we think about variables and data frames and columns in array, those are objects. So, so it's, it, it's a little bit different. So you can transpose, although I show both ways in that post. Um, Phil, who's on our team, he's like, oh, you don't actually have to transpose it to use it in plot. So there's, there's both examples there. So I imagine it's, because it, it's, so by default, if you move it from R to JavaScript, it's going to be column wise, but when you mm -hmm. transpose it, you make it row wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And somewhere West McKinney is crying to not using a column based data store. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think Phil, like Phil truly was like, okay, so Phil here in, in this comment. So I'll just read this because I also was confused. So I'll try to follow up about this too. So I don't okay. break any parts. Cause when I first posted this, I was like, oh, like my, my, my column loving heart hurts that I have to transpose this. And then Phil's like, no, 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 actually you don't, like don't have a broken heart. It can accept untransposed data. Um, you just have to like specify the variables in a slightly different way within plot to account for that. But you absolutely can use it. Um, just depends on, I, I guess, your preference for, for which way you do it. Even in JavaScript using the map might not work because that's mapping over an array of objects. Yep. And that might not like going over a column. Even though memory wise, it'd be better, but hey, all right, what are we going to do? <laughs> all right. Cool. All right. So, then some specifics about the types of plots. So, you, you talked about a legend. Can the legend be generated automatically? If you say fill equals a column name, can it automatically generate the legend? All right. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, maybe I'll just show an example. So, yeah. um, if that works. So let me go back to this line chart um, and I'm gonna change it back from my static, from my dynamic version. And I'm gonna say, I want the stroke to actually be based on type. Um, ggplot and add a comma. ggplot by default does add a legend when you specify, when you map a, a variable to an aesthetic. Um, in plot, that's not the default. So we just have to like manually specify that. So here I'll just say, for the color channel, I'm going to make sure to override the legend false setting, um, and then I can have a legend show up. And you can customize this, you can customize the swatches, you can change the color scheme like you would expect to, you can change the layout of it. Um, so absolutely, you can add legends based on variables mapped to chart aesthetics. And like Plotly can make it so you can click on the legend to filter out what's in the chart? Ooh, can you click on the legend? Not that I know of. That's a great question. Um, what you could do is make a, a custom input where like the swatch is just part of the checkbox, like the color swatch that, that then could be used to select the different options. Um, so you could make a custom one, which is kind of a nice thing about working in JavaScript is kind of like ideal for making those lightweight interactive things. Yeah. Good question, okay. but there might be something that is built already and I might just not know about it. Fair enough. All right, um, I'm gonna get back to plot specific things in a second because there's a question I meant to ask earlier. Um, can you embed these plots either in like a regular website or maybe even more difficult, a WordPress website? Excellent question, yes. 
So I think observable makes it pretty nice. Um, so if I go back and share my screen, hopefully you can see this. Mm -hmm. For any named cell, so here and here like by name cell, I mean like truly give it a name. So if I call this like my charts, for any named cell that doesn't show, change what shows up, just make, gives it a name. If you click on that vertical three dot menu, there's built in embed options. Um, and if you click that, then you can select the different elements, the different named elements that you would want to embed anywhere else, either using iframe um, or with React, for example. Uh, so you can then just copy um, the code or copy the URL and, and then just like embed that directly into another site. And I haven't tried it. You can see you can also do the entire notebook. You can make observable notebooks into JavaScript modules. There's like a lot of options for reuse. You can import pieces, which is so cool. And another session totally, so it won't get totally derailed here. Um, but yeah, you can, any named cell, you can just click that embed button, select the pieces you want to embed, including if it's interactive, and then go ahead and add that to your site. I haven't tried it specifically in WordPress, but I, I think that this should um, work as expected there. WordPress can be difficult with JavaScript. You have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. Yeah, maybe not. Um, I don't know what hoops you would need to make this work because JavaScript <laughs> is. I'll WordPress check. That's a good question. I'll write that down. Is if WordPress makes problems. Cool. Thanks for the question. I'll look Absolutely. into it. Absolutely. Right, now this we have other questions. This is actually one that I was thinking of. Um, I was watching you do a tutorial about this stuff and chaining together a bunch of function calls like dot map, dot filter, dot that. And I noticed that if I were doing it in the Chrome console, it auto completes like after each function, I do a dot, it knows what's available for the next methods and members. I didn't see that working in observable. Am I doing something wrong or can you not chain, not get auto complete for chaining? Um, for some of the methods, I don't think I know how to answer that question. Uh, okay. So I mean, um, for doing like data wrangling steps for, so, I think that the in some cases there are. Um, so let me just check. Um, and I'll just show my screen so you can all see me flail live because what is <laughs> more fun than just seeing people flail around? Okay, so if I share my screen, um tell you the types of methods that are available here. Um, so like like map comes up here, and then I could do my map of D of whatever D um, but I notice here like so here it's giving me um, auto fill options for what I could populate after this but maybe since this isn't like a recognized array then it's not automatically bringing up the array functions or the array methods um, or if I have objects then I would I think it brings up the methods that work on objects for example um, so yeah I don't have a good answer besides I think like if you have an array it should tell you what the array methods are and if you have an object then I think it will tell you what the object methods are. Um, but beyond that, I'm not exactly sure what the, the different limitations are for like the um, preview of what's available. Because um, maybe it, maybe for some of those, like an accessor function, it, it doesn't make a prediction about what it's expecting. But yeah, great let's, question. Let's say you did map. Let's say, and I know that you can't do d.column name. But let's say you did the map, then after the closing parentheses, dot, then another map or another filter or whatever. I don't think it's auto-completing there. Okay, so let's try. Yeah. So if I do D and then like type here, whatever, and then D here. Oh, so maybe, oh, interesting. So you'd expect here because that's just an array that that would also give tell you what to do. Huh, maybe, it's, maybe it stops at one. Oh, that'll be cool to look into. No, I, I am not sure what is underlying the algorithm for when that shows up, but that's a great question. Um, yeah, because it doesn't show up for me either. Yeah, good so point. It works in like the Chrome console, so I'm saying this as a feature request to make it work here too. Oh, no, that sounds great. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Cool, cool. Then I'm going to continue on then, hopefully not feature request. We'll never know. Um, <laughs> can you modify the plot aesthetics with CSS? Yeah, so you can create your own style sheets that get applied um, in different places. So you can 
fully customize uh, different pieces um, with CSS. I think a lot of um, a lot of the options that you want to customize um, are probably like built-in options within Plot. So I can send you. I'm gonna send you the Plot cheat sheets because they're pretty cool too. So for the observable plot cheat sheets, I think these are awesome. Um, these will give you an idea in an interactive way of what the different options are, but you can not only customize using the built-in options, but like it's just JavaScript code. So you can like fully customize with whatever additional JavaScript code you wanted to add like within plot here. Um, so I think the I'm answer- just... I'm just pasting your things into the chat for everybody. That's why you're awesome. here. Okay. Cool. Yep. You can you can continue speaking. I'm just uh, pasting the code. My keyboard's loud, so I wanted to let you know. Cool. Let me um, find one example. Custom elements. Just trying to find one example uh, where we update theme elements, um, and we do actually do some some CSS to like change the fonts and things. So here is an example where I think in this one, uh, we use some CSS to, to update the styles, um, like for fonts and font sizes, but you could do that for, I think, color schemes too and stuff. Cool, thank you. Um, all right, so then I know um, originally like D3, I think you used SVG as the underlying um, technology. And that can get swamped with large data sets. So I guess, A, what if I made a scatter plot of like the diamonds data, 50,000 points? Can I do that? And if not, can I use like WebGL to render this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I don't know WebGL, um, so I can't answer that part. Um, usually I've found that plot does all right up to around like 80,000 points okay um after that i've noticed sometimes it gets a little bogged down and i might just get like a spinning wheel uh okay. but 70 80 000 is maybe like an upper limit of what plot might be happy about okay all right and i guess you're plotting something like a map with polygons each vertex counts against that limit so if you have 20,000 polygons, but each one has 10 edges, 10 nodes, and that could, that could hit you. It could. Yeah. I think okay. I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it. I think like most of the like base maps I've been using, um, which I think is kind of nice for, for a lot of like the standard base maps, observable already has those built in. So they're like, like pretty nice shapes, but also not going to bog it down. So there's like a world map, US map, you can get the counties from that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would assume, and again, I don't want to say without knowing exactly what those limitations would be, but I think if you had like really high resolution spatial polygons, you would probably end up like reaching, uh, reaching a similar limit there. Okay. And then let's talk about the map then once you mentioned it. Can I like put the observable plot like on top of a leaflet style map so it's slippy, like a like, uh, zoom and pan? You can. Um, so you see leaflet, and that's something that I haven't done too. Yeah, bringing up all, all kinds of awesome <laughs> things. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely use, use leaflet in observable notebooks. Um, what I haven't done is um, observable plot with leaflet uh, and, and what that, that looks like. So, but I think it would be awesome. Um, I haven't tried it previously, but yeah, happy to look and check with the team and then send along whatever resources that we have. Perfect. Yeah. All right. um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, all right. Is there a reason, like what was the design choice that the output is above the code, not below it? Great question. <laughs> um, so I don't want to speak for Anybody else at the observable team um, who have been like very intentional about like designing the product and and it. so I think there's like um, documentation that speaks to this. Um, but what I will share is that it's kind of a, a a shift in mentality that like 
the priority in notebooks is going to be the outputs and people getting insights from the outputs. And then secondary to that is see the code if you want to. Um, and I think that's just not that that's not possible by having like a hidden code chunk and then only the uh, the output show up. But I think it, it like shows the intentionality of like the prioritization of the output that people are gonna see first with the code that's created that you would see below and not the other way around. Um, I think both work really well. I think it's like mostly was like a, an adjustment. I was like, I have never seen this before. My output is always immediately behind my code. And uh, now I don't even think about it. I'm like, oh, of course, of course that's where it shows up. But it definitely was a little bit of a surprise when when I first saw things showing up above the cells I was writing in. Yeah, it threw me for, for a while too. I kept watching like, what is this going on here? Then event, when, when actually I heard you say it one time, I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. I know what's going on. All right, cool. Um, in your columns, you mention them when you do marks, you give them as quotations, not bare names. So not like ggplot, right? How do you take the log of a column if the column is in quotes? Yeah, so you can do it a couple of different ways. Um, so you can actually do transforms right within observable plot. So instead of, for example, like, like um, X, quadrillion BTUs, if I wanted to transform that, I would just use my accessor notation. I could do like D arrow function D dot quadrillion BTUs divided by a thousand or something. So I can like add JavaScript code to access and transform a variable right within my plot code. Um, so that's one way. So if you want to actually transform the value of the variables and plot that, you can do it outside of your plot code. You can do it within the plot code with a with an accessor function to transform that. Um, but you can also actually just change the scale that's visually plotted. So like if I change, um, I'll just, just show this one. For example here, if I wanted to make the y-axis a log scale, then I could add here just like type and then add log here. Um, so I could put it visually on a log scale. That's not actually transforming the data. Um, or I could do within this Y channel, I could do like D, D, and then say like 2D quadrillion BTU, and then whatever the D3 probably function is to transform this to, I don't know if it's like D3 log or something. I'm guessing that's not it. But however I wanted to transform that, I could do that right in that Y channel. Um, okay. So either one of those or do it outside of plot and then use the updated transform data. Um, so I think there's a couple of different ways to transform data, either like actually transform or visually show transform scales. Right. And while you have your browser still sharing, uh, um, how would you make a hover tooltip over that line chart? Could you hover over it and Absolutely. So if I wanted to add that, um, the way that I have added it here, and again, I will share my screen, is um, there is in Observable, one really cool thing that like, this is a great question to highlight this, is any notebook that you can see that you have access to, you can access pieces from it, like functions or charts or whatever, or arrays of data using what's called an import. So the way that I think about this is like, imagine if any R Markdown notebook you looked at, you were like, oh, I wish I could use that function. And instead of being like, okay, I'm either going to manually copy the whole function or I'm going to like fork and clone the read access to it if it's not in a package or whatever. Instead, you just use this import and then you tell it what named thing from any other visible notebook in the observable multiverse of tens of thousands more than that notebooks exist. So this is a cell called add tooltips from Mike Freeman's plot tooltip code. Um, and I can then just use that. So this one, this function that Mike created, uh, you can go ahead and wrap around a your plot code. So I can just do add tooltips around my entire plot code. And then if I give my, I'm going to get rid of this log scale because that's just going to drive me up the wall. Um, then what I can do is if I add a title channel 
uh, then this will create the tooltip. So if I just do like title and then, um, I don't know, let's see what, what happens here. Nope, that's not gonna work. Uh, I might have to look up Mike's code here because there's something interesting um, about how these are created. Hold, a, hold on a second. And this is Mike Freeman, uh, formerly of UW, right? Yes, Mike, uh, yeah, so yeah, and who does a ton of awesome data visualization. Um, so here- I wrote a great book, uh, you know, the program, I have it right yes. above me, program skills for data. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Mike Freeman yep. has written a book in R. So he's another who's yep. also is, is, is a background in R. But here, yep. for example, I have this title now um, where I can customize this. So I can say these are uh, template literals, which means that I can have running JavaScript code within a string. So I can say I want this to start with the type and then um, have quadrillion BTUs since it's wrapped in add tooltips. Then when I hover over these, then I can see that those would show up over that. And there's in Mike's notebook, different options for applying tooltips over um, all of the plots in your, all of the plots in your notebook or just one, which I've done here by wrapping this one. Nice. Yeah. Great. That seems like a nice, easy way to do it. Um, just one or two more, because I know we are going a little long. Um, when you made your bar chart, it was like, you had to specify like the Y X, or in this case, the X since it was horizontal. You know, geom bar and ggplot can count for you. You give it a discrete X, it'll count for you. Can you do that here? Yeah. So the way that you do that is um, you can specify groupings or binnings. So for example, if I had, um, and I was just making an example of this earlier today. So I wonder if I still have it up, but like, of course I don't. Um, but yeah, actually I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show this one. Great. Okay. I did kind of have this up. So here's an example of what that can look like. This is using the penguins data set. So here I'm making a bar chart, um, but you can also designate how you want to group things and then give it a reducing function. So here I'm saying I want to group along like the x-axis variable, which here is by species. Um, this is doing some sorting, but that's optional. So I'm just going to get rid of that so that it doesn't like cause confusion about what we're actually looking at here. So this is like the, the meat of this chart, right? From the penguin data, um, I have on the x-axis species, on the y-axis body mass, but I'm also gonna group by the variables along the x-axis. And within those groups, I'm gonna apply a reducer to the y-axis variable. Um, so here, the reducer is mean, but I could also change this to count or or sum or median or deviation. And these are all like D3 methods, but there's a whole bunch of functions that you could apply to actually um, do these aggregated summary statistics by group within your charts. Oh yeah, somewhere in there, your plot, let's say you're setting the color to red. How do you mm -hmm. distinguish between the color red and a column named red? Oh, great question. I just learned this. Awesome question. If there's a column named red, then it will treat mm -hmm. it as the variable. That's what will that that's what it will select. Okay. So if you're in that unique position where there is like a, a web valid color name that matches a variable in your data set, it'll default to the variable or the property in your data. Um, so you'd want to use a hexadecimal color code instead for red so that it wouldn't get those confused. Got it. Perfect. Great question. All right. And then, all right, so then another one, some, I see still more typing. Um, for the radio, you know, like, if, let's say you're doing it by, based on like a, uh, an array, can you say choose the first one as the default? Because you might not know coal was the first one. Uh, ooh, good. So just choose the first one. Let me see. So I think what you could do is just, um, there's a couple things that you could do. You could use set, I'm just like brainstorming out loud, which is probably a bad idea 
paralysis with JavaScript, but whatever. One thing that comes to mind is that you could create a new set of all of the unique values that show up in that property um, using actually like new set as a method and then just access the first element of that array. Just do like square bracket zero to get the first value. Um, so I think that might be one way. I wonder if you could just do like values. It's probably, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I wonder if they have just made my life way easier. I'm going to check if I could do value, like value zero. That didn't work. So value, that also didn't work. Um, but what you could do, actually, maybe the easiest thing is to just, um, so here's, I'll, I'll put this in chat, but like for the, for the energy production, that line chart one is just to like regurgitate the map that gets each of the different levels and then access the first element of that just with square bracket zero. And that'll get you the first thing from that array. So there that might be sense. a more elegant way, but like that one makes sense to me and it works. Oh, cool. That makes sense. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, all right, then all right, just give a yes or no, then we'll let you go. Um, can you make animated maps? Uh, yeah, so you can use scrubbers that will automatically play that you can pause. Um, so definitely look up um, there's examples of scrubbers that you can import that will automatically play through your different visualizations. Absolutely. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yep. and Joyce did finish typing, but was actually saying great talk and that they love that you introduced JavaScript to map an arrow instead of loops because, you know, we're not into that in our, <laughs> in our community. Yeah, they're okay. nice, right? I actually, when I first yeah. saw them, I was like, what is happening, JavaScript? Why are you doing this to me? And now I'm like, I love map and I love ternary operators and I love arrow functions. Um, so yeah, I, I now appreciate some of the JavaScript specific things. What's that? Great equal signs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The strict equality operator. That's another one where I'm like, you know what? I've come to appreciate you. Um, nice. over these last few months. Yeah. Nice. Good. Good. Well, thank you very much. Everyone, let's get a round of emoji applause for our wonderful speaker this time. Um, I really got a lot of that out of this. Hope everyone else did. Uh, and then just as you wrap up, a few reminders. So again, the New York R conference is July 11th through 14th. Um, and discount code NYHACR. The our government conference, which we're announcing tomorrow, is October 18th through 20. The D4 conference is August. I don't have the dates because I did not write it down. And my hack R is a code for all of those. The websites are rstats.ai or d4con.io. And our next meetup is May 9th with Jeff Ryan. And we need space for June and July and onwards and speakers beyond that. So let us know if you want to attend the conference. Let us know if you want to host the meetup. Let us know if you want to speak at the conference or the meetup. All right, all that. I think I had a wonderful time. I know I had a wonderful time. I think that was all of our announcements. Thank you very much, Allison. It's been a pleasure having you here. And I look forward to using all this. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was super fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye.